this morning. Today is the 10th Sunday uh, after Pentecost, and today in our sermon, uh, our sermon text, as well as our uh, readings for today, the theme for our Sunday uh, focuses on the how we, as our as uh, followers of Jesus, will strive to imitate Him by seeing ourselves as His agents uh, to help other people in their time of need. Uh, is our focus for today. We follow the order of service that is found in your service folder. We begin this morning with our opening prayer. The Lord bless your worship this morning. O oh Lord, our Maker, Redeemer, and Comforter, we are assembled in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray you to open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word we may be taught to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and death, and to grow day by day in grace and holiness. Hear us for Christ's sake. Amen. We sing our first hymn, hymn number 421. Of your fatherly goodness, 
According to the promise of your word, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and implore you, dearest Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, our brother, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised again for our justification, forgive us all our sins. Through faith, which the Holy Spirit increases in our hearts to full assurance. We therefore pray you, O Lord, through your servant, to declare to us the forgiveness of all our sins. We poor sinners are willing to forgive all who have offended against us. We earnestly desire to grow in true godliness. Help us, O God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior,
righteousness remains forever. And he who provides seed to the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed for sowing and will increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you may be generous in every way, which produces thanksgiving to God through us. Here ends our second lesson. Please rise in honor of Jesus' name as we read the words of our gospel lesson taken from the sixth chapter of the gospel according to St. John, beginning with the first verse. After this, Jesus crossed over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he was performing on those who were sick. Jesus went up on the hillside and sat down there with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, Where can we buy bread for these people to eat? But Jesus was saying this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to have just a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what is that for so many people? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Then there were there were plenty there was there was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. There was about five thousand men. Then Jesus took the loaves and, after giving thanks, he distributed pieces to those who were seated. He also did the same with the fish, as much as they wanted. And when the people were full, he told his disciples, "Gather the pieces." that are left over so that nothing is wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with pieces from the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the miraculous sign Jesus did, they said, this really is the prophet who is coming into the world. When Jesus realized that they intended to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountainside by himself. Here ends the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God be
verses 42 through 44, which we read just moments ago. Friends, fellow redeemed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. After the Korean War ended in 1953, South Korea was left with a large number of children who had been orphaned in the war. Relief agencies came in to deal with all the problems that arose, especially with having so many children in the orphanages. Even though the children had three meals a day provided for them, they were restless. They were anxious at night and had difficulty sleeping. As they talked to the children, they soon discovered that these children had great anxiety about whether they would have food the next day or not. To help resolve the problem, the relief workers in the orphanage decided that each night when the children were put to bed, the nurses would place a single piece of bread in the child's hand. The bread wasn't intended to be eaten, it was simply intended to be held by the children as they went to sleep. Security blanket, if you will. And it was enough of a security blanket for them, reminding them that there would be enough for them tomorrow. And they were able to sleep. Anxiety fell away. It helped. It helped them. That piece of bread that they held in their hand as they drifted off to sleep. It's amazing what a little thing like a piece of dry bread can do. It shouldn't surprise us because God has been doing those kinds of great things with little pieces of bread for a long time. Have you ever felt anxiety over your daily bread? Are you a worrier? Do you scrimp and save? Counting every dollar, not wasting a dime, losing sleep because you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Or how are you going to pay your electric bill? Now I suppose that could be true for some of you, maybe a few of you. But I wonder if there isn't a different problem for most of us. This isn't South Korea in 1953. This is America in 2021. And even with some exceptions, we have to admit that we are living in some pretty favorable times. The recession of 2008 is a decade or more in our rearview mirror. 9-11's uh, fiscal effects, after effects, the mini stock market crash of 1987, the high interest rates of the early 1980s, they have long melted into ancient history, maybe even obscurity. And there's probably some of you who don't, weren't even alive during that time. And sure, there's a bit of a hiccup due to the COVID epidemic. But in the greater, scheme of, uh, the greater scheme of things, Things are pretty good. We work, we get paid, we have, with a few exceptions, our standard of living goes up and up. Maybe for some of you, the problem isn't not having enough, but rather having too much. With a need to downsize, to clear out, to reduce. And just maybe a voice in your head says, you know, I've done pretty well for myself. Just look at all the things that I've done. And then gradually our eyes go down from looking upon heaven in gratitude, instead looking down in self-gratitorial, congratulatory satisfaction. Look at what I've got. But you know there's a pressure that goes along with all of that, isn't there? All of the things that we buy, guess what? We're going to have to replace again someday. Do you feel the pressure that when you think about that, or do you feel that you need to keep up with your lifestyle, buying new, better things? 
this all the time? <clears throat> what if I'm in an accident tomorrow, or I lose my job, or my spouse loses their, our spouse loses their job? It's possible not to pieces of bread that we're thinking about. Put it this way. Are you happier now during than you were during, say, the recession of 2008? Another question. Why does a millionaire, even billionaire, commit suicide when they have everything that they could ever want? All they have to do is go buy it. Why aren't people with everything the happiest? How about you? Now maybe we are like the young, successful entrepreneur that I just read about recently. He opened his new office, waiting to send a message to everyone to tell them how great he was for, for doing this all on his own. He went into his office, it wasn't even completed yet, and he felt like a big shot. And then he saw someone out in the hallway, and, and he uh, sat down, as he sat down beside his desk, and uh, so he picks up his phone and pretends to have this conversation where he waves his arms and flashing numbers with his fingers, showing that he's a big wheeler and dealer, trying to impress whoever it was out there in the, in the, uh, in, in the hallway. The man in the entrance approached his office and so he hangs up the phone and, and he says, what can I do for you? And the man says, I'm here to hook up your telephone service. Are we pretending that we are the reason that we have so much? Are we pretending to be the big shot? Someone who knows what the truth is. I tell you what, the one who truly knows what truth is, is the one who provides everything that we have. About 2,870 years ago, God, the God of grace, showed just that. You see, Elisha was um, the main prophet of God in the northern kingdom of Israel in about 850 BC. Elisha succeeded the greatest prophet, the great prophet Elijah, who had a long career and who performed many miracles in the name of the one true God. I suppose you could compare it to a great Hall of Famer quarterback being followed by another great quarterback. Elisha has performed twice as many miracles as Elijah did. And he traveled around teaching people about God's promise, about the coming of the Messiah, teaching them God's will for their lives, and from time to time teaching at the School of the Prophets, as it was called, kind of like the equivalent of a college or a seminary today, training future prophets for God. Well, at the time of our text, we see an unnamed man traveling some 14 or 15 miles on foot to bring a little gift to Elisha. 20 small loaves of barley bread and a few kernels to munch on. Barley was cheap. It was about half the price of wheat. It was used primarily for cattle feed, but it kept the very poor alive. This gift, however, was the first fruit offering that was required by God in the Old Testament. It was to be given to the priest, or in this case Elijah, God's prophet, as part of his salary. The gift was given to Elisha. But what does Elisha do? He shares it with all of the students that he was teaching, again, called the company of the prophets. 
And just like Jesus did in our gospel lesson for today, the 20 loaves multiplied at least fivefold. Everyone had enough that they even picked up leftovers. Now this shouldn't surprise us at all because this is what God does. He takes care of his people. He provides for what we need almost always in the natural means, planting, growing, harvesting, buying, cooking, etc. Consider the promises God has given us in his word. Psalm 132, I will bless her greatly with food. I will satisfy Zion's poor with bread. Psalm 145, the eyes of all look eagerly to you and you give them their food at the proper time. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Sometimes God even breaks his own laws of nature and does a miracle. This week we had VBS. And uh, one of the themes of our VBS this year was that Jesus does the impossible. We looked at several of his miracles and how he was able to do things that wasn't scientifically possible. It wasn't some kind of magic trick. It's a miracle. It was a show of his power. And here we see God doing it for the needs of his people. We might ooh and ah about this miracle, but look again at what was behind this. An offering, a gift. 20 little cakes of bread from a, a conscientious believer who was willingly obeying his God. That's where this all stems from. So we see how our Lord uses people as his agents. Like he used the 12 loaves of faithful believer from uh, Baal Shalisha, he uses you, he uses me to generously supply what people need. Your job is your 20 loaves that God uses to provide your children with food and their needs. And medical care, education, braces, whatever it is. You helping your neighbor clean out her flooded basement on your day off is your 20 loaves that they needed at that moment. Your gift to a local charity is your 20 loaves that might extend the life of someone with diabetes cancer or disability. God takes what we have and he uses it to take the care of the people, his people, of this world. Often turning a little into a lot. Jesus also uses your generous first fruit offerings dedicated to God, given as a part of your worship, as a simple thanks to the giver of all. This account certainly underscores how God can do some pretty great things with any size gift. But it's even more than your offerings that you give to your church, isn't it? Your 20 loaves is everything that you are and everything that you have. Everything dedicated to God and put into his hands turns into something great. Infinitely more than we can ask or imagine, the Apostle Paul says to the Ephesians. Your talents, your skills, your abilities make you uniquely fit for whatever it is that God has you do. Whatever, whether it's your job, your, your ability to help people, it'll be your 20 loaves in God's hands. The time that you share in volunteering, mentoring, coaching in your community, your church, your family, or help a friend will be your 20 loaves. 
tools up in God's hands. The dollars that you share freely and generously to support worthwhile charities will be your 20 loaves in God's hands. This is how God provides. So generously in so many different ways. He's the provider, but now he says it to you and me. He says, you're it. He gives us enough so that we too can get. You can be generous on every occasion. Paul told the Corinthians, because your Savior promises that we will be made rich in every way. Think about that. And, and it's a reality, even if you don't think that you're, you're rich. You see, the heart of the account about the 20 loaves is not, the, it's not about the willing, generous first fruit offering of the man from Baal Shalisha. It isn't the poor college seminary students that were provided for that day. It's not even Elisha who is a kind of prototype of Jesus, like the Bible teaches us that Elijah was the prototype of John the Baptist. No. The heart of this account is two simple words. The Lord. According to the word of the Lord, Elijah, Elijah said. The Lord is the great I am. That's Jesus. So as Jesus fed the small multitude of a hundred prophets and filled the stomach of well over 5,000, all from just a little, he provided something far greater. Jesus suffered six hours on a Roman cross on the outskirts of Jerusalem. What did that do? It brought us a slice of forgiveness for every time that we worried about not having enough. Jesus' life, his perfect humility is the slice of mercy that covers our pride that we're guilty of when we thought that we earned everything that we have. Jesus giving of himself as an atonement for sin is the slice of his grace that takes away the punishment that we deserve for our stinginess. And the peace that he gives through his power, powerful resurrection, drives out any fear of not having enough from one day to the next. The Lord the great I am, Jesus, freely gives undeserving, imperfect, weak, and sinful people like you and me an eternity of feasting with God. At six hours, it turns out to be a pretty big thing. Did you know that the name Elisha actually means God is salvation? And it's related to the name for Jesus, the name Jesus, which means the Lord saves. Jesus did and does great things with very little. And the powerful generosity that keeps multiplying in our daily lives drives us to dedicate all that we have, all that we are, and give, to give and serve as generously as He does. And it's amazing what God can do with that slice of bread that He put in someone's hands. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. His peace be with you. Amen.
we continue with the prayer of the church. O oh Lord our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Give us teachers and students who pursue excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. We continue with our offering. We give thee but thine own, whatever the gifts may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. Amen. <laughs> 